Good evening and welcome to our celebration of English Language Day 2021, which we are commemorating with the five authors shortlisted for the Gratian Prize 2020. English Language Day at the UN is celebrated on 23rd April, the day traditionally reserved or observed as both the birthday and date of death of William Shakespeare. The day is the result of a 2010 initiative by the Department of Global Communications establishing language days for each of the organization's six official languages. The purpose of the UN's language days is to celebrate multilingualism and cultural diversity. And what better way to celebrate the day than with our very own Sri Lankan writers writing in English. The authors who will speak to us today have all been shortlisted for the prestigious and coveted Gratian Prize 2020. Some of the work is published, some not, but this evening's program, I'm sure, will be a voyage of discovery for all of us. And please do feel free to participate with your questions and comments. You can put them in the chat and we will take them up as we go along. We will begin this evening's program with Jehan Aloshan. Jehan is a full-time theater, theater practitioner. He has, over the last three decades, been involved with over 80 productions of English and Sinhala language theater. In addition, Jehan has been associated with the Royal Court Theater of London, Art of Bangalore, Theatrum Botanicum of Edinburgh, Brave Theater Festival of Poland, the British Council, as well as the National School of Drama of India. In 2001, Jehan founded Center Stage Productions, an amateur theater troupe, which produces original theater in Sri Lanka. As a playwright, Jehan has been shortlisted for the Gratian Prize for Literature in 2000, The Screaming Mind, 2008, The Ritual, and now in 2020, Mind Game. Welcome, Jehan. You are no stranger to the British Council or to the library. And congratulations on being one of the shortlisted authors for the Gracious Prize 2020. Thank you very much. It's an absolute honor to have been shortlisted. I'm thrilled. Uh, and also to be shortlisted among these wonderful other writers. Um, so I'm very thankful to the judges as well uh, for um, uh, allowing a script to really reach the, the shortlist as well. Okay. So, um, so you're a playwright. So I'm going to start with asking you, what prompted you to engage in this form of storytelling for Mind Game? And what is so appealing to you about writing a play? Well, I've been writing plays for about two and a half decades from the time I was in school. Uh, and um, uh, I always wanted to write something um, about mental health issues because this is something that I experienced uh, personally in my family as well. Uh, uh, there were... Uh, um, various incidents that really affected me and my life as well. And um, uh, I think in terms of dialogue and visuals, so uh, I think a, a script is the, is the medium that I would use to express myself. Um, and um, I really wanted to uh, uh, delve into the mind of my protagonist, Joyce, because I feel that um, she's a symbol of, as a, as a woman, uh, as well as someone who is battling uh, mental health issues. Uh, she is uh, dealing with some of the attitudes that people have towards uh, her gender as well as her, her, her condition. Uh, so uh, through the character, I was um, I, I tried to create this scenario that is that is basically a family. The play is about a family, uh, a family with secrets, and um, as many families do. Uh, but the problem with secrets is that. Um, that these secrets can become malignant and uh, they can sometimes uh, poison relationships and consume people. Um, so uh, I, I chose to set the play in, in a house in this domestic space and to make it a, a symbol or a microcosm of society and the Sri Lankan community uh, and to interrogate some of these um, uh, uh, the issues that this character faces. Um, so that's, I mean, that was my initial um, instinct when I was really going into actually writing the script. And of course, over 
uh, the two decades that I took to actually revise it and rework it, uh, um, uh, things changed. And uh, I used to do unusual things when I was very young, like put, putting myself into an insomniac state and uh, and writing in a kind of lucid state uh, because there are scenes that I wanted uh, to uh, be in Joyce's mind and I didn't want them to be absolutely clear. I wanted them to be ambiguous and ambivalent. So I... Um, I put myself in that state and then I would revise it in the next morning. Uh, so it was an unusual process actually working on this script, unlike some of the other more structured plays that have a, uh, you know, have a very definite scene structure and things like that. Uh, there were moments of surrealism that I injected as well when I was writing it. So it was an enjoyable experience that I, for me to actually work on it, but it was also an education, uh, uh, um, you know, getting advice from uh, 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 the academics, as well as the writers, as well as my university professors, uh, when I first started creating the script. Uh, and I think um, the fact that it was shortlisted now, I think, is uh, uh, all thanks to the other people who really helped me uh, to get the script into a, a stronger sort of piece uh, as a, a stage play. So that's a very long answer I think I've given you. <laughs> You've also answered my second question, which I was, I was going to ask you about the plot and for you to tell us without giving too much away. But having said that, well, I'm yeah. so glad that you have addressed mental health because this is something yeah. that we, everybody wants, nobody wants to talk about, you know, but I think, yeah. it's, I mean, and it's, it's not a secret. I think every family struggles with, with this, you know, in some form or another, at some yeah. degree or another. Yeah. So I'm so glad you have brought this. I hope you will stage this play. Uh, I hope so too, because uh, I, I've been having readings over the last few years, and those readings have really uh, uh, helped me to uh, revise the work also. Uh, but uh, I think, you know, the attitudes, you know, over the last 20 years, things have changed, you know, in terms of uh, uh, the, the the role of, uh, not the role, but uh, I think social media and uh, uh, certain other, uh, um, you know, historical sort of uh, incidents have helped change uh, some of the uh, attitudes uh, people in general have towards women from when I first started writing it. My protagonist uh, is, is in a constant battle with the patriarchal forces that attempt to dominate her and to demonize her voice. So at the time I was writing, she was almost... Uh, you know, she would probably have aligned herself with more of the Virginia Woolf's or the, you know, uh, the Sylvia Plath's or even a little bit of Jermaine Greer because she was very angry, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, as a, as a, and she would uh, fight back, if you like, to her art because she's an artist. She would, she would use her art in order to speak when she's stifled by uh, these other forces that uh, tend to demonize her or to, uh, disregard her voice because of her mental illness or mental health issues, as well as her gender. So I had to temper some of these elements when I was revising it and reworking it because I think now there's a stronger voice for women. Uh, and I have, I have been, uh, most of my plays uh, have a, um, I mean, I, I do write feminist literature. Most of my plays are set in uh, a very strong female characters and uh, uh, they are, uh, like ritual or even stormy weather, and now my waves there they are set in this uh, domestic space, which also becomes a pressure cooker. You find all these characters trapped in there, and you have, find this family almost imploding, and these these issues can sort of you know keep building and uh, and well up and almost um, uh, implode if you like. So um, um, so yeah, that's a little bit more I think about uh, the uh, the play. Yeah. Okay, and I also want to ask you, you know, you have worked both, both in English and Sinhala drama with, with drama yeah. books. How yeah. has that experience helped you with your writing in English? Well, I, I write in Lankan English. I was uh, in the University of Colombo. I, I, my dissertation and my focus was also on psycholinguistics uh, to try and establish Lankan English as a legitimate uh, language variant, which is not a bastardization of uh, the the a uh, good standard British English, if you like, so-called uh, standard. Um, so which, uh, I think there are several playwrights who now use English to write uh, serious, uh, to grapple with serious issues. 
and not to use it as a as just comedy or just like the button that people press you know to make people laugh because uh, someone can't handle uh, you know the english language or speaks in broken english is like uh, so i i also work with the single language students but uh, and what i found was that when um, single language theater directors such as balasubramanian Bar- 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 for example saw my play the ritual uh, he he said told me that um, He, he didn't feel he was watching a, an English play, and I was very happy about that because it was not that we were we had a lot of code mixing or code switching in the singular language, but it was because I feel uh, the, the performers had really um, worked very hard. I mean, even actresses like Tracy Holsinger had worked very hard to unlearn, you know, certain types of you know uh, speech that she had assimilated uh, overseas, and uh, to get a very Lankan. Tone to bring uh, to bring these characters that would naturally be speaking in the singular language to life. So even in my play, um, my games, these characters are more middle class, so they would be speaking in the in English language. But there are a few other characters that do speak uh, would naturally be speaking in singular language, and the for dramatic effect, or we take a s- certain dramatic license, if you like, and give them a type of English that uh, that is has more code switching and code mixing, and has the 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 little term metaphor and what about the singular language uh, in order to uh, make it because we are, we're telling the story through dialogue that's what we do as playwrights because we don't have the luxury of descriptive passages we have to tell the story through dialogue between two people and uh, and bring in as much uh, nuance and subtlety and uh, Uh, and poetry to like in just uh, just two people talking um, uh, so 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 language is really important and i think working with the single language theater and working with practitioners as well as performers in both languages uh, really helps me when i'm writing because i've also written in the singular language my reality shows also written in the single language so it helps me to sort of shift so it's not uh, it's not english theater or singular language theater but it's theater And we are Sri Lankans. We need to have an identity that is Sri Lankan theatre, and we, rather than just English language theatre, single language theatre, or Tamil language theatre, or whatever, uh, so that we can take our identity and our performances out of Sri Lanka into other realms and in, uh, perform at festivals and and also as literature. So that's important. I probably come back to you on that, but thank you for now, Jahan. Please don't go away. Thank Thanks you. very much. Thank You're you. You're welcome. My next guest. is lal madhavasa gather who is also no stranger to the british council and in the to the grace of prize lal has been shortlisted previously for his work the window cleaner's soul 2002 and won the grace of prize 2012 he teaches english at the open university of sri lanka and has published three books the window cleaner's soul can you hear me running a collection of short stories and playing philo politics at mgk a novel which won the grisham prize 2012 lal can we have lal hi, hi lal hi. oh i can see hi. you how are you welcome <clears throat> so thank you bring the cleaners and cfl bulbs bulbs have inspired you in the past i am curious to know what's behind restless rust restless rust a uh, shipwreck a <laughs> shipwreck inspired me. a half submerged ship wreck inspired me seriously uh, look restless rust restless like all my like my other novel it's a um, it's a conglomeration of lots of plots happening uh, and uh, like my last novel i played with time and space i played it i disrupted time and space uh, so much so that uh, some people were confused that was the reaction i was aiming at so here is here once again uh, restless rust is actually a metaphor for mind some of the uh, rusted uh, what can i say rusted notions ideas concepts that we have not that and that a narrator has not dealt with are suddenly brought out so that is restless rust uh, i borrowed that phrase from a deflected song huh? that's not mine it's it's already it's already i uh, there's a deflected song called animal i a british heavy metal band like they are one of the greatest heavy metal bands in the world i mean i i borrowed that from one of their songs the the title so, so it's like an introspection the novel is about an introspection is it is it like like yeah. a, like an internal monologue kind of thing 
yeah oh, yeah you you got the word right but i think uh, let me add to that uh, introspection are generally not structured and they irreverent right that's what my novel is it's a irreverent and <laughs> it's a very I'm irreverent and not irrelevant but thank you lal so i I'm, i'm really looking forward to this this is in manuscript form it hasn't been published yet no no not yet okay. uh, i've been approached by publisher so i'm like uh, editing it right now okay so how did how did winning the ration prize 2020 impact your writing uh no i didn't i didn't get you please can you repeat that question yeah how did winning the prize the ration prize oh. in 2012 yeah. How did that right. impact your writing? Like, has that influenced the way you you approached Restless Rust? Ah. Uh. Okay. Uh, in 2012, I didn't expect to win the prize. Number one, uh, <laughs> I didn't expect to win the prize until the last moment. Ah. Uh, uh, I think uh, that had. I don't think it had any bearing because uh, Restless Rust is even much more. wild and much more what can i say irreverent ir, uh, irreverent and much more what can i say much more rough than uh, mgk actually so so it has not affected me i'm still uh, i'm still very humble about it i i mean i mean i think uh, i mean mgk had certain i mean i didn't see the what can i say until i until the judge judges read their long report i didn't know that uh, the novel had so many merits you know you only know your novel has merits when someone else analyzes it for you it was something like that so i mean uh, so when uh, so when the judges said certain things about the novel then i said oh right this is what i have been doing i mean that's the way i always write i don't think about uh, all those i try to tell a good story a very irreverent and a very time space um, sort of mucked up story and and and, and then if people find something I'm so happy. That's why I look. I didn't actually. It didn't bother me at all. I'm not here, Sabina. I'm like any one of the five shortlisties uh, with with a manuscript, right? That requires a little bit of editing. Yeah. Okay. I'm just going to change tack. So you also teach, Lal. Uh, yeah. How do students who haven't grown up uh, speaking English uh, and yeah. in English-speaking households how do they respond to studying in English and how do you bring you know this whole background you have as a writer and all that into the classroom? them to make it more accessible right okay there are two answers to that look uh, i come from my first language is not english i come from a very what can i say a very singhala speaking family right uh, but uh, the, the the way i conquered english is i read books i'm from the time i remember i been a bookworm i mean after i i played cricket and i lost my cricket career owing to injury uh, how i dealt with that injury is by you know reading books so that that's what happened i was like uh, fast bowler pretty awesome fast bowler and i lost that career so then i went to reading books uh, something that happen uh, when you read books is that you know automatically your uh, articulation improves your language improves so that's how i did it uh, and uh, okay uh, and that's how i suppose uh, lots of people who come from even like people who have been worse off than me have you know that's how they have done it it some somewhere down the line something uh, sort of some some kind of input some kind of input that you require uh that's that's uh, when i go to teach something i understand is look writing and teach writing and uh, analyzing literature are two different things right i mean they are like two different they are two different like countries nations huh? okay when you write literature you don't worry too much about theory you're worried about the you're worried about uh, a plot you're worried about a universe that you are immersed that you have yourself created and now the universe is moving at a pace and you are like forced to catch it there are voices speaking through you when you writing that's the way i look at it uh, when you are teaching literature you are very conscious you are very conscious of language you are conscious of the structure you are conscious of the words how they have placed it you are conscious of the author's background and uh, you are also conscious of how students how say for example uh, most of the literature we teach is very eurocentric in the sense that it's very very british with very little american uh, so uh, you are like uh, trying to figure out how to give a give this particular concept to a culturally different audience and so you are innovating so it's a, it's a completely different issue uh, i don't think we need, i i don't mix them up but but the fact that being a writer someone who creates literature who gets analyzed in classrooms i know that you know uh, that you know there are some i know that there's a process happening it's very difficult to combine them uh, okay. i hope okay. i have answered your it's two different countries two different nations and you need different visas to get in to those countries 
Thank you for saying that about reading because I know right now we have a 10 year old in our audience and I'm so glad that you're talking about reading and how important it is because that is something we really want to engender with our library services as well. Thank you, Lal. Please don't run away. Please stay. I'm just getting my next guest and we will come back to you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Chiara Manduli Mendi says, the red brick wall is also on the shortlist for the Gresham Prize 2020. She is reading for a Master of Arts in English Studies at the Department of English, University of Colombo. She is serving in the Sri Lanka Administrative Service as the Assistant Director, Literature and Publications at the Department of Cultural Affairs. And she is also a journalist for the Lanka Woman magazine. Chiara? Hi, Hi, there I'm you good. are. Welcome and congratulations Thank on you. being on the short list. Thank you so okay. much. Yes. yes, and your book is called The Red Brick Wall. So the metaphor of the brick wall has always been a very powerful one for me. I'm curious to know what aspects of this symbol you have explored in your collection of short stories. Right. So, um, yeah, so Red Brick Wall is actually one of the titles of one of the short stories. So okay. when I uh, looked at the collection as a whole, um, what I wanted to explore was the, um, the similarities between people who are like separated due to their differences. So since I'm interested in language, I think I focus mostly on uh, linguistic and cultural differences between people. So uh, I thought like choosing this title uh, would reflect the entire collection. That is why I picked it. And uh, so, you know, like the, so I wanted to, so you know how red brick walls are built, like built brick by brick. So this entire collection is actually an effort to uh, tear it down brick by brick through storytelling. So that was like my effort and also um, like being in administration i see how the policy decisions that you make uh, in a larger level like with respect to gender administration economy etc uh, so how these things affect as barriers at interpersonal level so that is also something i wanted to discuss so uh, but uh, then again like this is just my reading of it the metaphor and so as we all know like it could be different to yours. So metaphor is actually like a mapping between conceptual domains. So uh, so it is like open to interpretation and there could be a million other uh, interpretations. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it because for me, uh, I think I, when I was very young, I heard Pink Floyd's Another Brick in the Wall. Mm -hmm. And uh, that has really resonated with me all my life. I felt like a, like a, like just a brick in a brick wall, mm -hmm. so this is wonderful. How many short stories in the collection? Seven stories. Seven stories. Ten, ten. I hope you get it published soon. Uh, um, ten um, stories. Sorry? Ten stories. Ten stories, okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, and I hope you get it. And also, I want to talk a little bit about I, I, I know you don't currently teach, but I think World Englishers is one of your pet areas. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I want to know whether, because today is also English Day, I want to know is what we call Sri Lankan English part of the World Englishers lexicon? And what is the importance for Sri Lankans to use Sri Lankan English? Right. So, um, yeah, so my MA dissertation was on uh, conceptual metaphors of Sri Lankan English. So I'm actually very interested in Sri Lankan English. So uh, when we talk about world Englishers, I think uh, with the spread of English uh, around the globe through uh, diverse ways, like, for instance, colonization, uh, then like communities started to adapt these varieties of English according to their own sociolinguistic uh, context. So, so the, the native languages affected to language contact and then the, the histories, the cultures and the socio-political context. So all these things affected these varieties. So uh, different varieties of English started to emerge from around the globe. So these are what we call New Englishers or World Englishers. So, uh, so these have their own features like in the aspects of lexis, syntax, etc. 
So when we talk about Sri Lankan English, so that is our very own variety of English. And it also has unique features. And um, I think in my case, uh, I think to me, it is very important that I use Sri Lankan English because um, personally, I feel like it is a very liberating experience to use it because I can be very authentic and I can express my uh, culturally constructed conceptualizations and uh, my worldview and the way I think because I think I can relate a lot to it. So uh, this is why I prefer like studying and using Sri Lankan English. Okay, thank you. And I also want to ask, going back to the collection, I want to know how an author decides on, you know, on that, why did you think I'm going to write a collection of short stories as opposed to a novel? I mean, without having a central protagonist and exploring that aspect of a brick wall, why did you choose a, a collection of 10 stories? So uh, I just want some insight. Right. So this collection, actually, so I, I haven't written short stories for a long time. And uh, I, so I was given this gift, uh, The Thing Around Your Neck by Chimamanda. Uh, right. Yes. Yes. And so after I read it, I really wanted to write a story, uh, especially in second person. And okay. so during the last lockdown, I uh, wrote one story, and then so um, yeah, I got good comments, and so from especially the people that I look up to, and uh, then I was like encouraged to write more. So that is how like I kept on writing. And uh, so when like something, a point hit me or when I discovered something perhaps like through one of my research findings or something, then uh, I wanted to like explore it more because um, so I think like I read a lot of singular novels and singular, singular writing as well. So I think in singular, uh, we hear a lot of stories even about the same subject. So we get to hear like, um, diverse aspects of the same subject so in english i wanted to do the same thing because so as you know like as uh, chimamanda says the danger of the single story so when we hear about a single story we tend to stereotype and i wanted to like break these stereotypes and bring out like different aspects of the stereotypes that we have in the society especially uh, when it comes to women so um, that is why i actually wanted to write it and so it was actually quite fun writing this because I felt very happy after I finished the story. So yeah, then yes, that is how this collection came to be. <laughs> Wonderful. I'm ho I'm hoping that people listening will be encouraged to make use of you know the time, maybe a little extra time that they might find these days. Thanks, Thank Kiara. You. Don't don't go away. Okay. And I'm just going to invite my next guest. Thank you. Thank you. Carmel Miranda's Cross Match is also on the shortlist for the Gratian Prize 2020. Carmel was born, grew up, and schooled in Colombo. She studied medicine at the Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo. She's an anesthetist, and I'm looking forward to asking her about her medical connection to her writing. She gave me a very brief bio note, <clears throat> as you can see. Carmel, welcome. Can we have Carmel, please? Hi there. Hi, Carmel. Hi. Welcome. Thank you, Mrinali. And congratulations again on being the show. Is this is this a debut? Is this a debut work? Yes, is yes it's the first thing oh. I've written. How exciting. I yes, want yeah. to know what mysteries of the... Because your book is a crime book, right? It's, it's a crime novel. Yep. Yep. I want to know what mysteries of the medical profession has prompted your work. And I also want to know if you have... I'll let you answer that before I go to the next one. Okay. Uh, so in addition to being a, a crime novel, as you describe it, it's also a very medical novel. And as you know, doctors and med the medical world is often portrayed in fiction. But I have observed that the portrayal is often very unrealistic. And doctors are made out to be a lot more glamorous than they actually are in real life. And when I read books about doctors, or especially written by non-medical authors, and watch uh, medical TV dramas, it doesn't quite ring true. So I thought 
I should try to convey a more realistic picture of what it's like in the medical world. See if I can uh, convey a little bit of that grit beneath the glamour and okay. down to all the unpleasant sights and revolting smells that sometimes go with the job. So I thought, let me try and paint a real picture of what it's like uh, in the medical world, especially for a doctor in training. And the reason I chose a medical student as a protagonist rather than a doctor is again, doctors are very commonly featured as either you know heroes or villains. And medical students hardly ever. And I thought it would be interesting to see the medical world through the eyes of somebody with very little experience, fresh eyes, who has not yet become hardened and developed the self-defense mechanisms and the coping mechanisms that go with being in the profession. Okay, so I'm, I'm assuming that you, you've also been inspired by maybe people like Agatha Christie or Ruth Rendell or P.D. James, maybe. I'm just wondering whether you've read their work and whether that is what prompted you to write a crime novel. <clears throat> yes, actually, I've read all of them. And I am a fan of uh, mystery and crime uh, novels myself, actually, is one of my favorites. And uh, I thought that I would make the book a little more interesting by weaving a mystery into it. So, because I didn't want to bore people because when doctors sometimes we talk about medicine, it can get boring to non-doctors. So I wanted to keep readers interested and there's nothing like a good mystery for that. So, um, so you have like Agatha Christie has generally a fight and Ruth Rendell also, they have quite a big body yeah, count. Yeah, I mean, quite a big body count. Yeah, so this, I, it's not a typical crime novel. It's not a, exactly a whodunit in the classic sense of uh, you know the word. But um, Agatha Christie, I mean, she had some really good plots. But she didn't really get in, like she didn't take us inside the people's heads and tell us exactly what they were thinking. Uh, like P.D. James, for example. So I really admire P.D. James' way of writing because she tells us what the characters are thinking, what they're feeling. And I've tried to convey a little bit of that in the book rather than just discussing, you know, events and one uh, action scene after the other. I've tried to show what people are feeling, the protagonist especially. Okay. Um, I just want to know when you're writing, uh, you, you, do you think in English and formulate yep. it? Or you do? Okay. Because what, I mean, what role has English played in your life? I'm assuming that all your studies as a medical student were also in English. Yes. Okay. All right. I'm sorry, Carmen. I think your connection is a little bit slow. Yes, I mean, I uh, my media for, medium of instruction in school was in English and, and in medical college. OK. Yeah. Uh, well, in, uh, is that better? Yeah, much better. Yeah. 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 So in, uh, yeah, in, in medical college, the medium of instruction was English. So anyone who studied in any language in school eventually ended up, uh, you know, studying um, uh, learning in English. So I I happened to be in the English stream in school. Um, okay. And I ended up so, in, in medical college was the medium instruction was also in English. So writing came quite naturally to you in English. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Okay. Thanks, Carmel. Please don't go away. I'm just going to grab, I think, my final guest, and then I'll be back again. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Minali. Thank you. Thank you. Our final guest is Amina Hussein, author of Chasing Tall Tales and Mystics, Ibn Batuta in Sri Lanka. Amina is an author and co-founder of the Pereira Hussein Publishing House, the front runner for cutting edge fiction at, from emerging and established regional authors. She has published one novel and two collections of short stories. A non-fiction book shortlisted for the Gratian Prize 2020 
and the 14th century Moroccan traveler Ibn Battuta in Sri Lanka was published in November 2020. Amina, oh, there you are. Welcome. Thank you. Hi. Congratulations. Hi. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm really, I know that your book is published. I, I mean, it's, I have it as a Christmas gift. I'm waiting to get into it. And I'm, I wish you well uh, you. with your future writing. So I want to ask you, um, why, what is so fascinating about Ibn Battuta? So, you know, we must have learned about him in school. When you learn, you, you have a brief subject on world travelers who came to Sri Lanka. And so there's Marco Polo, Fasien, Cheng Ho, and I'm sure Ibn Battuta was there as well. But I must confess, I didn't know anything about him except his name. So I was really lucky that in 2013 or 20, 2013 or 14, I went on for a conference in the Maldives. It was called the Silk Roots Conference for writers. And when I went there and I met these 10 writers from South Asia, but we also had a writer from Kyrgyzstan, I was really struck when we were talking about the Silk Route how one name kept cropping up, and it was Ibn Battuta. But anyway, we had a lovely time. We discussed. He wasn't the central, the central character to the conference. And I came back to Sri Lanka, and we, uh, Sam and I, have this uh, coconut estate in the north of Putlam. And one day he came home. He came to the farm, and he said, "I have a surprise for you." And he showed me a photograph of this really dirty, grimy street sign that said Ibn Battuta Street. I was, I was really shocked and surprised. And that's when I thought, if we have a street in Putlam uh, named after this great traveler, I'm sure we have signs of him somewhere else. And then I decided to track his route and to go on the route and it actually was the journey of a lifetime for me. I had so much fun. I learned a lot about my own country, about the history. And so Ibn Battuta was a 14th century Moroccan traveler who traveled to something like 40 countries. He traveled over 29 years. He left at the age of 21. His dream was when he left Morocco, he went to Mecca on pilgrimage. He heard about China and how, what a wonderful country it was. He decided to go to China. And so he visited all the other countries on the Silk Route and the Maritime Silk Route. And so that's how he came to Sri Lanka on his way to China. Wow, when he was only 21. He was 21 when he left. He returned at the age of 49. And he was really, his in opening passage in his book was really emotional and touching because he said he left all by himself and he cried because he felt very lonely. But he was part of, he joined a pilgrim trail. And the pilgrim said, don't worry. We are your family now. And we know what it is like to be all alone because all of us have come at some point or the other. We have felt like that. And I thought, how many 21-year-olds in today's world will actually go thousands of miles from home not know if they'll ever see their family and not know if they'll ever return and this is not i mean what year was this so it was the 14th century he came to sri lanka in 1344 so oh. it would have been he left morocco i think in the early uh, 1320s okay so no 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 airbnbs and Hotels and nothing like that. No, in fact, when he talks about Sri Lanka, he stay. He specifically stays in the king's palace, the the king of Jasna's palace in Puttalam, and then he stays on the way up Adam's Peak because that is the reason why he came to Sri Lanka is to do pilgrimage up Adam's Peak because then, as it is even now, Adam's Peak is a very holy mountain for the Buddhists, for the Hindus, for the Muslims, and for some Christians. So he stayed in caves. He stayed in people's houses. He uh, 
he drank from water from streams and it's a real insight into life at that time i'm very excited thank you amina i also want to know uh, as a publisher can you tell us something about that process and why you and sam chose to you know become publishers and what what writing in english do you encounter from sri lanka and you know what 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 is the quality of it and you know so so to answer very quickly the first two is uh i when i published my first book 15 in 1999 it was actually an ngo that published it the international center for ethnic studies because there was no uh the, i i can't say there was no i think there were very very few publishers who were running a publishing house on the lines of any international publishing house so somewhere at that time in 1999 i thought you know after i've retired after uh, after 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 I will run a publishing house but when I met Sam and married Sam we discovered that we actually it it was a concept and a venture that really fired our imagination so we quit our jobs our well paying jobs in Europe and we came to Sri Lanka and maybe today uh when I see young people and they're really fired up with enthusiasm it reminds me of myself uh some people might say it was a foolish decision but it was purely a decision based on on madness on love on 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 passion for english writing in english and the publishing industry so what kind of manuscripts come to us we've been really lucky in renavi it has we've had such wonderful authors who have come to us authors who have themselves been shortlisted for the gration who have won the gration and shortlisted and longlisted for international prizes so i think writing in english in sri lanka is alive and well and thriving wonderful to hear that thank you and i hope reading is too i hope you find that you know people are buying the books and also in reading them because that's so important as well the thank only you. reason we exist is because there are those wonderful readers out there okay wonderful don't run away thanks amina uh, thank i will just just check the chat now for and see what questions have come up thank you you're welcome okay so we have we have a 15 year old and a 10 year old if anybody wants to ask any questions please put them in the public chat and i will pose them you can tell me which other to ask as well but in the meantime um let me just see okay thank you very positive comments thank you i'm just going to come back and ask um jahan Sajid, can you please have uh, Jehan come up again, please? Hi, Jehan. Thank Hi. you. How old were you when English as a language made an impression on you? How old was I? Uh, yes. Well, I English as a language is it? Yes. Well, I English is my mother tongue. It's a language that I speak at home, and uh, it's a language that I um, I think in and I dream in, um, but. Um, uh i think as a language as a tool for engaging with other people and literature and the world outside i suppose uh, that was when i was able to read the english language and to uh, even to read scripts and things like that i was uh, i started writing plays at a very young age as well but um, um i i think I'm, it was probably on, on my mother's lap that i first started using the language uh, and uh, um in in all its amazing you know richness and and really actually studying the language and the attitudes towards the speech community that came out uh, in uh, you know when i was in the university of colombo when i was doing my research over two years with the english language training unit uh, as well as with students uh, and then i realized that the politics in the university uh, were actually affecting the kind of attitudes towards the speech community uh, uh, so you'd find people who were very interested in first year wanting to learn the language because it was a language that was going to get them jobs and and uh, really uh, make a change in their lives um, after a couple of years or after the first year of university politics they were not really attending lectures and they 
they they were saying things like you know you know they were saying different things but, uh, but i think it's important to really know that uh the english language is what connects you with the world and uh, opens uh, your mind to different types of literature as well as education as well as opportunities which is the language of opportunity so uh, uh but also giving um importance to language variants so that each country has its own variant each region has its own variant even in in the uk for example uh, giving importance to that and uh, and identifying those variants as rule governed entities and using those in literature that is also important i think i've gone away from your question and it just rambled a bit but uh, but for me it is an ongoing education for me working with the english language so it's not something that i just discovered suddenly on a specific day but it is a continuous discovery to like and it was like your first consciousness was in english kind of that's what you're saying uh, yeah because uh, yeah i Uh, because i i think and dream and everything in english language uh, but it's lankan english so there is uh, but uh, in, it's so strange someone someone actually said uh, um you know do we actually dream in different languages i i have not dreamt in the singular language or whatever I, because i do remember my dreams my mom used to ask me to write my dreams down and the pretty uh, pretty intense dreams sometimes and they uh, i mean they actually spark uh the creative been this creative spark for plays as well but um uh it's certainly the language i i uh i was not taught the tamil language and i'm very upset about that because i was i studied in a singular medium in university as well as in school uh because there was no english medium but we we had to sit at the back of the class and translate while the lecturers were speaking in english and teaching subjects uh such as international relations which is the most popular subject at that time in the university of colombo uh, in the arts faculty and that was taught to 300 students in the singular language but all the textbooks would be in english so we would uh, help the students to translate and that helped us to learn as well uh, but uh, so we thought even if we didn't uh, do well in our studies that these were good translators you know at the end of the day because we were translating literally even for, uh, sociology and psychology and all of that we would be translating at the back of the class while the lecture was being given in the, the singular language uh, but thankfully the textbooks were in english most often so <laughs> i was going to ask my next question because there is a there's a student there there's a child here who wants to ask uh, how to become an author at the age of i mean she wants to become an author I want to ask Lal because Lal has already written a book. Thanks, thanks, Jehan. Thank you, Lal. What's the age involved, please, sir? Um, I, this this girl, I think she is. She says she is ten years old now, but she says from the time she was eight, she wanted uh-huh. to become an author. Right. what can what advice can you give somebody like that who wants to become right. an author okay like i said there are two aspects the the art and the science the art is what you create that is i think she should uh, read she should select some authors who inspires her and as much as possible read their books read about their lives how they wrote the books right so let's say you a um, pick out like i don't know any blighton you should do read all her books and also read about her life how she wrote the books what inspired her to write and that's that that's that that is how you sort of manufacture your art you read and don't stick to any blind then move move on keep on moving keep on moving your authors don't stick to one author keep on moving and read uh, don't and also don't read books only from britain read sri lanka india thailand there are great authors in those countries philippines usa france they have a brilliant set of authors and scandinavia you get absolutely stunning authors read all of them that's that's how you build your art then you need to build your science how you build your science is it's good to have some training in english literature i mean not too much not too much i'm not talking about ma or phd level uh, say a, say o level a level literature and yeah obviously a ba in a university right you should have a little bit of training there that will give you here and there i mean uh, places like british council they host uh, creative writing workshop uh, authors come and talk there uh, 
so i think you should go to attend some of those right okay and then start writing and when you start writing also don't uh, depend on the viewpoint of your parents they always say you know you are the greatest author but don't depend on your parents and what you call relations take make sure that you sort of send your work outside because the the the, the critical test of a piece of writing is the stranger should love it strangers who know nothing about you should be inspired by your writing so those are the three things i would say the art science and the what is called the critical test i hope uh, i was understood okay thank you i hope i hope i think you will have to go back i'm i'm, I'm telling the, the the girl who asked the question please go back and watch the recording of this event because you will be able to pick up what the authors have said and you you'll be able to take down notes so please go back and this will be available on youtube so go go back and download it and watch it again and again because it will help you Um, this platform only allows me to have uh, three other people on screen at a time, so that's why I'm bringing in one person at a time. Uh, there is a question for Amina, um, and they want to know. Sorry, Lal, there's also a question for you, but I'll ask. I'll bring you back later. Amina, they want to know uh, what were your main resources for Ibn Battuta stories? Any surprising anecdotes you came across about Sri Lanka? So thank you. That's a very interesting uh, uh, question. So my main, so I actually had to read a lot of history. So firstly, my main resource was Ibn Battuta's book. I had to read the Rihla, and that took a few months for me to read it. And then I had to know about Sri Lankan history. I think uh, Tennant was uh, was a, a good source for me to go into. But then. you read all the all the colonial writers and they must have loved this country a lot when they came in all these young civil servants who came in under colonization because they did so much of research they were interested they discovered many of our archaeology sites and they set the groundwork for you know what our archaeology department does now so i would say if you let's see i'm trying to also the mahavamsa the mahavamsa the chulavamsa the, they were amazing amazing books as well that i got a chance to read not in its entirety if i needed to check a fact i would go and read it maybe my biggest discovery and surprise discovery that i encountered was in kurnagala when i came across this deity called gale bandara so gale bandara is uh, is what prince vatimi became and that whole story about prince vatimi bone kabaho which i had never heard of before and didn't know anything about came alive for me and then when in looking for the sources you discover that colonial writers have also mentioned this phenomena and there are it, it's strangely absent from the mahavamsa but you can find other other parallel ancient accounts that have mention of of prince vatimi and then how he became gale bandara thank you amina thank you uh, we also have um, i'm going to ask for kiara if, if if i think kiara will be one of the better people to answer this question can kiara hear me Yes, I'm going to put my glasses on. Hi, Kiara. Um, uh, Somebody is asking, what are your thoughts on mixing Sinhala and Tamil words, phrases, idioms into Sinhala in, into English literature? Right. Um, right. So I think uh, so. When you write, and when mm. you are bilingual or multilingual, uh, so this is also the uh, concept of translanguaging. So you don't actually uh, stick to one language. instead you have a repertoire um, of all the languages that you know uh, the the syntax the lexis and everything there with the metaphors the idioms so from which you can draw from whenever you want so when you write i think depending on what you are going to write depending on your setting and the conversation and the story you can bring from that repertoire the idioms metaphors so through chord switching chord mixing so i think this is like uh, like this uh, mixture that you are doing in your head that comes out 
through writing. Um, so if, if you are saying that you are mixing Sinhala and Tamil and English, so that come that should come out naturally and you naturally draw from your repertoire. So that is, as I said, the concept of translanguaging. So I think it is important to do that because when you, when, uh, you look at like the contemporary society, like the people that you meet. So for me personally, um, in order to uh, portray a character in an authentic way, I think I think uh, it's really good to code switch and code mix because we really do that, don't we? So we, we use a couple of Sinhala and Tamil words in the middle. So yeah, I think it's important to do that. Uh, and also Sri Lankan English allows that. So yeah. And to make it more authentic, that's what you're saying, to make the literature yeah. of a Sri Lankan English literature more authentic. Yes, to, to, uh, to reflect the, the actual Sri Lankan context, because we have two official languages, uh, national languages, Sinhala and Tamil, and the link language English. So might as well use all of them. So that's very good for, for, for young people who are trying to write. You know, I mean, if they feel their English is not too good, it doesn't, I mean, they can brush up their English, but they can also switch into some of the more comfortable phrases. Yes, because your mother tongue and your the, the mother tongue should not be looked as looked at as a barrier. It should be looked at as an asset because like to have to know another language is to know a second soul. There's a saying. So so all these are resources for us. So I think we are actually really lucky that we have three languages. So we live in a context where there are three languages. So we have to look at it that way, very positive way, I think. Thank you, Chiara. I'm going to ask Carmel this question because I think this is her debut novel as well. Um, they want to know what advice can you give to amateur writers, especially on deciding if your writing is ready to be read? Basically, I have stage fright for my book, which I wrote as a child. It is written for children. So this was your first book, Karma. And I mean, yes. were, were you yes. nervous about showing it to people? And you know, what, what advice can you give yes. somebody like this? OK, I can identify with uh, the questioner, because my book was just sitting in my computer's hard drive for about a year before I decided to show it to anyone so it does take a bit of courage uh, to take that first step but uh, but without that you're never going to get the book out there so show it maybe start with friends but don't believe them because <laughs> i mean i you, sometimes they just want to be nice it's not that i don't trust my friends but it's easy to start with your friends, but at, at some point you have to go out of that circle and show it to some, like like Lal said, show it to somebody who maybe doesn't know you that well, but who's interested in reading and writing. And, uh, and that's how it goes. But you have to take a printout tomorrow and show it to somebody. That's my advice. Thank you, that's so encouraging. So I, I think... I think this lady, I hope you will make sure that you, as Thomas says, take a printout and show it. And you know, and maybe you can go and meet Amina sometime. And Amina will be, we will put Amina in trouble. But thank you, Kamal. Um, th there is another question. No, I think I've pretty much exhausted all the questions in the chat. So thank you, everyone. Um, I think it only leaves for me to say my thank yous. So thank you to Jehan and Amina and Lal and Kiara and Kamal. Thank you to the audience and to the authors for, for interacting and for sharing all their thoughts and comments and for taking this time to be with us. Uh, we wish you many wonderful hours of writing for the authors and we hope that our listeners will engage in a lot of reading and researching and also printing and sharing whatever they may have already written. Thank you to the Gratian Trust and particularly to Professor Nilu Mel and to Nafisa Ameruddin for the support. They really made this event possible for the British Council Library. Look out for these and other work by, this, by the Gratian Prize winning authors in the British Council Library collection. We, we carry all of the, uh, the winning um, books in, in, within our physical collection. 
And even though our physical libraries remain closed because of this pandem pandemic, you can still access our resources via our digital library or by using our online book ordering facility. And you can find information for both these on our on the British Council website um, and also on our Facebook pages. We have a vast and wonderful collection in our di digital resources that cover, um, you know, fiction and news uh, magazines and newspapers and music and, uh, you know, uh, educational resources. So it's it's a very large and you know it's a very useful collection and you can become an, a digital library member and uh, you can use the mylock app to download any of these resources onto a mobile device um please join us for our future events next month we are interviewing of uh, dr razin sali and captain elmo jayawardana are in conversation uh, on a topic called rediscovering sri lanka so for the gentleman who was interested in even batuta and that and, and travel books this this conversation will be of particular interest so please do share the news and please do join us um next month that's on the 8th of may at six o'clock which is a saturday so thank you again for being with us and thank you to the british council team uh, especially shiroma and sajid and uh from me all i have to say is good night and stay well and stay safe thanks a lot goodbye